What's going on guys? Thank you very much for coming back. Today I'll be doing Edmund's brother, the one that was wronged all along, Edgar, from the play King Lear by William Shakespeare. Now what I advise you to do is I want you to read every scene prior to listening to my analysis because I don't really talk summary, I talk analysis. So what I would want you to do is the moment I say act one, scene two, and I start analyzing it, you pause my video, read Act 1, Scene 2, even, if it, even in a simplified version, and then play my video and see what I say. And then again, for the next scene, which is Act, which is act 2, Scene 1, you do the same thing. Anyway, to cut to the chase, in Act 1, Scene 2, Edgar is too honest and decent to suspect Edmund of any duplicity. You know, remember how Edmund betrays his brother? He trusts his brother utterly and agrees to be led by him. There is great irony in Edgar's comment about a villain having done him wrong. He is right, of course, but he does not know for a moment that that villain is his own brother. So some critics have argued that Edgar, like Cordelia in Act 1, Scene 1, does not appear in a good light in this scene. Both misjudge their fathers and suffer as a result, which is very identical to Cordelia. Now, however, it is important to remember that the message Shakespeare is trying to impart here is that if natural law, which holds that children and parents should love and respect one another, is turned on its head by evil, self-serving children and morally blind parents, then tragedy will follow. What happens in Act 2, Scene 1 is Edgar is caught off guard by Edmund's rapid fire warnings and questions. He reacts instinctively, obeying Edmund's order to stage a mock fight, even though doing so makes no sense. And Edgar is so decent that he never suspects for a moment that Edmund is lying to him. Edgar f Edgar's flight plays an important role in the plot. Now, with him gone, Gloucester is more easily persuaded that his dutiful and loving son has betrayed him, and Gloucester disowns Edgar and rewards Edmund, and it appears that the forces of good are no match for the forces of evil at this stage of the play. Remember what happens about how Edmund really cuts himself with the sword, pretending that it's Edgar who has done that? Now, what happens next is that in Act 2, Scene 3, in the soliloquy, Edgar shows that he is more than just Edmund's dupe. He is not feeling blindly, uh, but he has made a plan to avoid capture and death. Edgar's madness reflects Lear's, but Edgar's is fiend, whereas Lear's is real. Now, his fall into this humiliating situation mirrors Lear's descent into madness later in the play. When the king roams the countryside covered only in garlands of weeds and wildflowers, now again the difference is one of choice. Edgar can and does resume his old role easily while Lear struggles to do so. Edgar's final declaration, it says Edgar I nothing am, advances the theme of nothingness as he claims that all he once was is no more. By the way, still applicable to Lear as well. Um, he has lost everything, even his identity, and this symbolic descent into nothingness foreshadows Lear's descent into despair and madness. And Edgar's disguise also reinforces the theme of appearance versus the theme of reality. So we could just say the theme of appearance versus reality. That's a, that's, that's a nice theme that you can talk about. Now, both Edgar and Kent, two noblemen, are reduced to pretending to be a beggar and a lowly servant, and the world Lear has created by abdicating responsibility and giving control of the country to his evil daughters is one in which everything is turned upside down. The worst have the highest power, and the best are increasingly being reduced to the worst positions in society. Very ironic. Now, as the evil characters flourish and the good characters are stripped of their power and influence, the audience wonders uneasily what is in store for this very much new world. And in Act 3, Scene 4, Edgar's disguise as a bedlam beggar plays a role in developing Lear's increasing sense of social justice. He realizes too late that as king he was responsible for all his subjects from the highest to the lowest. Lear's meeting with poor Tom marks the king's transition from sanity to madness. He tears off his clothes and shows his obsession with his daughter's treatment of him when he asks poor Tom if he was, if he was the victim of similar filial ingratitude. And then later on in Act 3, Scene 6, 
Edgar's soliloquy once again links the main plot and the subplot, which is a very important thing that you have to, to keep in mind how the subplot is linked to the plot. And when I say that, I mean Gloucester and his sons compared to Lear and his daughters. He and Lear have been reduced to fiend and real madness respectively by the cruelty of their family members and Edgar's loyalty to Lear is clear in the scene. His empathic uh, and compassionate nature contrasts starkly with the unfeeling coldness and cruelty of Lear's enemies. Edgar is growing in stature as the play progresses and initially he seems a little pathetic and too gullible to be a future leader, but now his best qualities are being revealed. Shifting to Act 4, Scene 1, the irony of Edgar's comments about having reached the depth of despair is clear when he sees his blinded father and realizes that there is no limit to human suffering. And the audience may well wonder why Edgar does not reveal his identity to his father. One possibility is that he believes Gloucester needs to come to full self-knowledge in his own time. He believes that if he reveals his identity, he might be hurting his father. So this is a view that is supported in Act 4, Scene 6, when Edgar says, Why I do trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. Another reason may be that Edgar suspects Gloucester will refuse to allow him to accompany him to Dover if he knows who he is. Now after all, Gloucester dismissed his old servant because he thought it was dangerous for him to be associated with an outlaw. And he may also fear that a loyal and loving companion would try to stop him from taking his own life. Um, in Act 4, Scene 6, Gloucester notices the change in Edgar's voice and tone. He speaks in verse once more, as befits a nobleman, and someone in full command of their faculties. Gloucester has changed, but so has Edgar. He has come to a greater understanding of his father and has forgiven him, and Edgar's presence highlights the heart-rending nature of this scene. He stands by as his father expresses his despair, saying, if Edgar live, oh bless him. Edgar also witnesses the pitiful reunion of Lear and Gloucester and his words echo the audience sentiments, says, my heart breaks at it. Now Edgar continues to display his intelligence and ability to mold circumstances to his advantage as he changes role, yet again to persuade Gloucester that he has jumped from the cliff but has been saved by the will of the gods. In this, Edgar is like Edmund, in that he can manipulate his gullible father, but unlike Edmund, Edgar uses his power to do good, which is very important when you want to analyze the differences between two brothers. His role is to lead Gloucester along the path to self-realization, and this scene advances the theme of appearance versus reality. Edgar adopts different disguises and persuades his father that he has thrown himself from a cliff top and survived and Edgar's comments about Lear help the audience to see that the old king has, paradoxically, achieved insight through madness. Finally, in Act 5, Scene 1, shortly before the battle uh, between the British and the French, Edgar adds to the tension by issuing a challenge to Edmund. This is a very important scene. His challenge reinforces the idea that this upcoming battle is ultimately a fight between good and evil. Now, Edgar's handing over of the letter to Albany greatly increases the already tense atmosphere at this stage in the play. And in Act 5, Scene 2, Edgar's hope in the power of divine justice is crushed. And in this short scene, he urges his father to hope for the best but has to face reality and tell Gloucester that Cordelia and Lear have been defeated and captured. And despite the bleakness of the situation, Edgar remains resilient. He reminds his father that life is not easy and that part of the human condition is accepting that. And Edgar believes that everyone has a preordained time to die and that there is no point in fighting it. This is what he means when he says, ripeness is all. Now, there are the last uh, scene in Act 5, Scene 3. Shakespeare's audience would have considered it important for Edgar to prove himself as a leader by fighting Edmund. A king was supposed to be able to lead his armies into battle, and Edmund in the last scene shows that he is capable of doing so. 
and the fight between Edmund and Edgar is symbolic. It represents the battle between good and evil, and Edgar's view of justice seems rather cold to a modern audience. He says that the gods punish people according to their sins, and Gloucester was tempted when he saw Edmund's mother's beauty, so he lost his sight as a result. You see the relevance here of how he has made this bastard and why he loses his eyes after all this time. Now, although he does not mean to do so, Edgar causes a delay that results in Lear and Cordelia's deaths. Now, his long story of his journey so far wastes valuable time, and Edgar is poised to be a fair, honorable, and decent ruler. He proves a note of hope, and the audience can feel reasonably certain that the future is in great hands. Basically, guys, this is everything about Edgar. I really suggest that you read the play's summaries the uh, scenes summaries prior to actually uh, taking notes for my analysis or you can just take notes and then link all the analysis of mine to their perspective respected summaries anyway this is everything about edgar uh, if you have any questions please do not hesitate to put them down below in the comments and see you next time